let's move on to homelessness. And actually it is linked because I, I haven't written the stuff and I think it's 24% of street homeless people have seen or been victims of domestic abuse. Um, but 86% of the street homeless are men or that's the case before COVID, of course. It's all in flux at the moment. Um, you know, and street homelessness um, increases, you know, your likelihood of dying prematurely is through the roof. If you're on the streets, you're likely to be, you know, a victim of abuse on the streets. Um, and there's a lot of very complex needs um, that could, you know, we could work on, but we haven't historically seemed to be bothered about because they're mainly men, you know. And, I mean, there's statistics from Wales that show one of the um, reasons that you'll be given priority access to housing is if you've been a victim of domestic abuse. And, you know, there's a significant proportion of men who qualify for that. Um, And yet, you know, they never have, they have not been being housed. I I can can, prioritize. I can say something about that because uh, like two months ago, a letter went out or one and a half hour months a letter went out uh, from uh, Scottish officials about domestic abuse during COVID and homelessness and that they need housing. And it was exclusively for women. So I wrote them a letter saying, how can it be that when you talk about rough rough sleeping and homelessness, you completely exclude men? And I had a back and forth. And I'm very happy to share that back and forth at one point. It was absolutely appalling. And the best practice guidance for domestic abuse and homelessness in Scotland is written by Women's Aid. And it completely ignores men. Men do not exist as victims of domestic abuse. And they are not mentioned as uh, facing homelessness because of that. Um, in When I refer to that, when I wrote them letters back, they completely ignored it and they just kept talking about violence against women and girls, violence against women and girls, violence against women and girls. And she, the lady did start the letter, of course, men that experience domestic abuse should have the same right to housing as women that experience domestic abuse. They just don't exist. I mean, she didn't say that word for word, but that was... Essentially, the that was, they should get the same support, but women are victims of domestic ab- uh, abuse and it's a gendered crime and blah, 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 blah. And so in the end, she just explained to me why male victims of domestic abuse do not have the right to house, to housing. It, it, absolutely appalling. As far as I'm aware, also, um, not only have a majority of the homeless been from an abusive home, but also, uh, I, I think the most of them also have a mental illness as well. Yeah, very much so. Very much Sorry. so. Um, so just to, I can give you some numbers about Scotland. So, um, analysis of Scotland household survey data suggests that around 5,300 adults sleep rough at least once in a year in Scotland. Um, This equates to an estimate of just over 700 people on a typical night um, in Scotland. And 80% of the rough sleepers are men, but that's not being mentioned. So what I just told you was from the government statistics, and they don't mention gender once. They don't say that it's predominantly men. I had to go to organization called uh, Simon Scotland and said 80% of rough sleepers are men. And uh, 54 of ac- applicants to Scottish councils are male, but 80% of rough sleepers are male. So um, yeah, there is a, there is a huge difference. And men, uh, women are seen as more vulnerable and the reason why they are seen as more vulnerable is because they say that they're more, more likely to be sexually abused. 
But the thing is, they completely ignore that men are far more likely to be attacked and uh, and beaten. And um, another thing that they bring up is that women are more likely to go into sexual relationships to not end up as rough sleepers and homeless, which is true, I would say. But to be honest, for gay men, uh, a lot of young gay men that end up homeless, they also trade sexual favors for a place to sleep. And the thing is, well, okay, the women trade sexual favors not to be rough sleepers. Well, the straight men just don't have these o this option. They just stay on the, on the street and are being beaten up. So, yes, I do think women face slightly different experiences, but that doesn't mean the experience of men is better. In fact, I th it might be worse. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Sorry, little rant from my side. <laughs> that's, I think that's perfectly warranted. Mm -hmm. Should we move on to criminal justice? Yes, yes. Yeah. Um, I, well, I, I, in. <laughs> I can, I can um, say anything more succinctly about that than Philip already has. It was perfect, exactly. So, in 2019, there were 21 times more men in prison than women, despite men only being convicted of six times more serious offences. Um, disparities in um, being sentenced to a, a custodial sentence um, are in play there. There is sentence length with men being given longer sentences um there's parole because women are more likely to be disciplined for bad behavior but they're also more likely to be paroled early mm -hmm. i don't know how that makes sense um and also women are more likely in terms of sentence length to have mitigating factors added to or sorry subtracted from their sentences like the appearance of genuine remorse and having children um and no previous convictions whereas men are more likely to have aggravating factors added to their sentences like being part of a gang or um not showing sufficient remorse uh, and having stuff like penis? that so hmm? or having a penis having <laughs> a penis that's, like, a bit, that's a pretty aggravating factor convicted of having a penis mm. Um, um, women are also far more likely, uh, so there are a lot of studies saying, oh, uh, female offenders experience domestic abuse, uh, so their sentence should be reduced, where they don't even look at men, they don't ask these questions at men, and in the domestic abuse bill debate, in uh, Parliament, there was a guy who was very, very focused on head trauma and that uh, head trauma in, during life can lead to becoming an offender, but only talked about women. And he said, oh, so many women are beaten around by their husbands and that leads to head trauma, which causes them to become offenders. And I'm like, yeah, what about men? Men are far more likely to be beaten up mostly by other men, but still, you should, if you look at offenders, you have to look at female and male offenders in all regards. It's funny how it's actually become like a meme that feminists use of, what about the men's? As though that's an unreasonable request. Like, yeah. when asking about gender issues to look at the other side is an unreasonable request. Yep. Yeah. But, I mean, you know, I, there are very few prisoners, male or female, who don't have significant kind of vulnerability factors, whether it's abuse or mental illness or, you know, they're poorly educated, um, didn't have jobs, they were homeless. Fatherlessness you know. is a massive part in, in this as well. And, 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 I, and considering we were talking about how much women are encouraged to keep the kids, you know, for as long as possible and the father only sees them maybe one weekend a month or whatever. If that leads to a, a substantial amount of criminality, it should be seen as abusive as well. 
Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. Absolutely. I hate how um, um, in like, Scotland like, in Scotland they are talking about um, reducing uh, female prisons because they think that prison is not the right place for women and that female offenders should have a completely different approach. And I just find that mind-boggling. I mean, it's such a slap in the face um, of all men that need so much more like compassion and, and support to actually become a part of society again. It's like, no, 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 women, women need more help, even though 90-something 90, 90 percent of prisoners are men. And the argument that women use when it comes to domestic abuse saying oh we need 100 percent of the funding or 99 percent of the funding because the overwhelming majority of victims are women um that doesn't work when it comes to uh men that are the majority of something so oh we are the minority of um offenders so we need all the funding for them and all the support it's, yeah it's Absolutely absurd. Well, it's 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 like that. You know, one thing that really frightened me that the um, that that um, politicians, particularly Scottish politicians from the SNP, would make this argument that women are fifty two percent of the population, so they need more of the funding. You know, and it's it's like asking the question, how did that end up? Because that's not what the birth rate is. You know, so it's exactly. it's, if, if, if women. <laughs> If women are a minority, they need the funding so that they can gain equality. Whereas if women are the majority, they deserve more funding because there's more of them. Exactly. Um, and it's it really it bamboozles me and it really aggravates me that you can see people can see the fact that uh, when whenever uh, like young black men are convicted more often than their their white peers people will automatically identify that as institutionalized racism. But, but men, men being convicted nine times uh, out of ten, you know, or being nine, nine out of ten inmates, that is because men are worse. Men are just, just biologically worse. And it's the exact same logic that was used by racists 50 years ago. They said, Absolutely. well, the reason black people are in prison is because they're worse than us. If they're if they're being like feminists are being slightly honest though, they will accept that there's a gap and they'll say that it's sexism against women. Yeah. Because they're not taken seriously as criminals. Yeah. yeah. I, I remember I, I brought it up in our gender studies class again. I brought this up and our gender studies teacher was like, Well, yes, that that there is that factor, but also there's a thing called double deviance, which affects women, which is to say that sometimes when a woman commits a crime that men more often commit, she's seen as worse for doing it. And the example was like Moira Henley or something. Moira Henley, you know, the the the, the yeah. monster, right? And it was like a, a lot of women absolutely despised her because because of what she did you know and, and they saw like how could how could uh, a sort of um you know a female do that to a child but i do but, think, i do think that i do think that um actually um women that uh, are abusive to children um i do think they sometimes deserve more compassion uh, in regards to mental health issues like uh, postnatal depression and stuff like that, there should be that should be more talked about. That should be more addressed. There needs to be more help available. No question about that. Although but Moira Henley, as, her her abuse was in sexual in nature, and it wasn't yeah. her children. Um, yeah. But I just yeah, I, yeah, want, I know that I know that I know. I just but, want but, to point out that that like she was comparing uh, men going to prison twice as often for the same crime with the same criminal record and spending 60% longer in prison. She was comparing this enormous gap to, I don't know, an anecdote about Moira Henley. Yeah. yeah. Not yeah, all I, she I, had. I, I just think, I, I think I'm actually absolutely okay with women getting um, the compassion that they do get as prisoners or if, as offenders. I think that's wonderful. And I think that we always should look to... Uh, like domestic abuse and stuff like that to a certain extent. But mm -hmm. that to be exactly the same for male offenders. You have to look at, yeah. like, I don't want less support for women. I want the same yeah. 
and the same compassion for male offenders. Um, and I, I would like to share a little anecdote from a Scottish prison. So um, I listened to a radio segment on BBC Radio uh, Scotland, and it was about um, therapy animals in prison. And because I had access to two dogs, one of them being my dog, I thought I could drive to the local prison, which is two and a half hours away, and I could bring my dogs to the prison so that the prisoners can interact with, my, with the dogs and play with them. And I thought, oh, that's, that could be cool. So I contacted the prison, and first there wasn't a huge amount of interest, but all of a sudden I got an email and they're like, this is an amazing idea. Please come down. And it was great. So I drove down and I talked to the prison director and he was all up for it. And everybody was really excited. And because I'm a hairdresser, I, I could also train them to cut hair so that the inmates can cut each other's hair. And everybody was really positive and really on board with that. And I went there three times to talk about it. Um, and then a nurse from the NHS joined the conversation. A woman. It was the first time a woman was part of the conversation and it was rejected immediately. It was, they, they said, oh, um, yeah, but you to be fully trained, uh, therapy dogs and it's not proven that it helps. And she just... Like there were two prison guards and they were all really positive and then she was uh, it was her and she was just a full on party pooper and it she, she tried to destroy everything we tried to build up and claiming that it was a, a health and safety issue where it really just was a um, I want control over the situation I'm the mental health nurse here and I don't want to give any of my power away I'm it's possible that I am um, reading something into the situation I do think that my reading is fairly accurate I can't be 100 percent sure but it was sad so it never, it never yeah. happened so sometimes it feels to me, you know, the, the, the disparity that you're describing, uh, Philip and Liz, um, it's almost like like female prisons are far into a progressive future where we're starting to look at the entire way we rehabilitate people, asking is this is this the correct method? Should we be trying other approaches? Should we be more compassionate? And that male prisons are stuck in the 1800s where they're just like, Slap them, you know, with the, the biggest book you can find and keep them in a dungeon until they re regret ever having committed that crime. Um, you know, like it's it's not about it's not about rehabilitation because we know that um like people turn a blind eye to things like rape in male prisons. Mm -hmm. how how is how is someone who is raping and on a, 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 in a daily basis? going to be suddenly a, a, a reformed citizen when they get out? And how is someone who's going through that abuse going to be a completely healthy participant of society when they get out? You know, well, well we, have to say, we have to say rape happens and sexual abuse happens far more often in female prisons amongst female offenders. So the numbers for, for women committing uh, rape and a sexual assault in prison are higher than for men, far higher. Um, and these women don't get the support they should get because society doesn't look at female perpetrated sexual abuse. Um, so there is that. Uh, that. That absolutely is true. And I know I, I, I completely agree. But I would say that trying to reform the entire prison system is also you know going to effectively eliminate things like that or at least you know in practice would eliminate so people even if they're not looking at that issue specifically they are looking at um the causes of those kinds of issues whereas with men mm -hmm. the plan is to keep it going as long as it can you know it's worked forever and it'll work forever and it's it's perfect as is but obviously with women we understand that the prison could do better. You know, it does feel as if you've got two completely different ends of the scale from different centuries almost. Yeah. yeah. I, can say, I, 
the healthy middle ground because you know I think that there are women who aren't in prison like Lavinia who should be um you know and I think that there is um there is probably a tendency to you know to overlook behavior so you know like I said women are disciplined more often and yet they're paroled earlier it's like if you are misbehaving in you know prison and if you are abusing people in prison then you shouldn't be let out straight away you know you sh should serve your full time um but yeah. you know for men you know and a, a lot of the things that are going on with women in prison you know like we scrapped plans in the UK for more women's prisons and instead we're redirecting the money towards community hubs where they can get treatment for addictions and mental health problems and try to learn skills and get themselves on a more um, a, on a better pathway where they can contribute to society you know and I want to see that for men too yeah. yeah but as you said a healthy mix is very important um, I, I would like to end this uh, topic with a positive thing. So when I went to the prison in Inverness, uh, what they do, did have, for example, is that um, dads could spend time with their kids in the morning for breakfast. So they could have breakfast together. And uh, so the dads could actually prepare for school and go through school uh, homework. And I thought that was absolutely wonderful. That was great access access meaningful access to families is um a major predictor of not reoffending when you get outside yeah. you know there is you, know, you, you need know? something to look forward to you need something to you need to be able to take responsibility and 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 a safe haven because otherwise you you're as lost as you were before maybe even worse because you had uh, negative experiences in prison so yeah. I would say in terms of the, the healthy middle ground, Liz, that, um, that it, it should be the punishment should fit the crime. You know, so if you want to have prisons that are lighter and prisons that are much heavier, it should be based on the crime, not the gender. You know, like people who dodge tax or whatever shouldn't be put in with murderers if you believe that... Um, there, there should be some kind of heavy and light sentencing rather than it being like a man, whatever he does, whether it was, you know, um, stealing like a, a bar of chocolate all the way to like murdering a city, that they should all be grouped together and that women likewise should all be grouped together. And it's by gender that the light and heaviness is divided, not by crime. It should be the crime for the punishment. I mean, I don't think that the criminal justice system is there to enact you know to balance some kind of cosmic scales of justice and so when people say you know the punishment should fit the crime i think that that is only useful in terms of how far the punishment or the consequence can prevent someone from repeating the same crime or moving on to more serious offenses so that is my real um, objective in the whole criminal justice kind of sphere. I want to reduce reoffending, and you know, I think I think there should. I think there should the oh, so so sorry for interrupting. I think there should be a huge focus on uh, on mental health problems, and if people are being identified as that they are sociopaths or uh, psychopaths. Um, you just ha sometimes you might have to say sorry, but you are here to society, and we might have to focus on the ones that are are a that we are able to to help more. Um, and yeah. and I think it goes maybe a little bit in the direction what Hat was talking about that we might need more uh, prisons that are focused on maintaining danger and other prisons that are more focused on actually reintegrating people and maybe you can move from one prison to the next um depending on on how well you did in this prison then you can re be more and more integrated reintegrated yeah. i mean you know that there are an absolute 
fuck ton, if you pardon my language, of men in prison who don't need to be there and who would be better served in society. Um, you know, if with society can support them, if society can support them, the problem is if you take them out of prison and they end up back on the street, for example, um, they need a brotherhood, they need a family, they need some, some meaning in life. If they just go back into a gang or, or into, yeah, poverty, it's, it's not, society has to change, society has to, has to have structures where people actually can come back to. So is it fair to say um, the assimilation of your, your possession, Les, is that rather than the punishment fit the crime, the rehabilitation should fit the crime? The rehabilitation should fit the potential for a brighter future. Well, but yeah. I, I totally agree that, that there's very little point in punishing someone who and not giving them the help to not reoffend. Yeah, you know, because it, you're and essentially is you're essentially giving a, a criminal a kind of a time bomb before they explode again. Yeah. You know, it, it, it needs to be focused the, on stopping recidivism above all. Yeah, else. the vast I, majority I, of prisoners will re-enter society at some point, so we better do everything that we can to try and fix them while we've got them in custody. I I would love to share a little story from my military times with you. Um, so I did something very, very bad at the military. I left my locker unlocked. And in Germany, in German military, there you have to get punished for that because you're tempting your fellow um, uh, soldiers to steal from you. And so I was called to le the lieutenant, and that was not my normal military compound. My normal military comp uh, compound was great, but these guys were just total pussies. Uh, and so they, they called me, uh, the lieutenant called me into his office, and he said, you did something very bad, you left your locker open. And I was like, yes, I know, I'm very, very sorry. And he said, yes, well, I have, I'm going to have to punish you for that. Um, but because you're such a good soldier, um, I thought a very light punishment would be in place. Uh, you just have to write an essay about uh, why it is important to lock, lock your locker. And I said, oh, that would be wonderful because I love writing essays. And he said, oh, but if you find that wonderful, then it's not a punishment. And I said, Lieutenant, we don't punish in the military. We have educational exercises. Um, and the, way, the reason why we have educational exercises is to teach people why what they did was wrong. If I write this essay, I will know that not locking my locker was wrong, something that I already know. But, you know, you can also punish me harder. You can put me into prison over the weekend. And after this weekend, I will know exactly what I already know that it was wrong to not lock my locker. Or you can actually like charge me with a lot of money. And do you know what I will know after paying this money? That it was wrong not to lock my locker. It's something that I already know. And do you know what he did? He said, okay, you can leave, bye. <laughs> and I just, because I just outsmarted him, but the, secretly I just thought, you're such a pussy. You should, should have just said, okay, I'll send you to prison or whatever. But the thing is, I but already... did you offend? Pardon? No, I did not. <laughs> I did not. Exactly. Well, can, I, can I just warn you, Philip, that it's very likely at some point you're going to get an email where you have to speak to that lieutenant's boss and the boss will say, it's not about what you said, it's about how you said it. And you invalidated him and you made him feel that you weren't listening. Do you understand? And that, oh, those, I are hope, his, those are his lived oh, experiences. I, I really, really hope that I made him feel disrespected because I deeply disrespected their pussy, pussy like, 
uh, the, the pussyish ways. And I'm sorry, I'm very sorry for using that word in a negative way, but they were just, they were so soft. They were like, they had absolutely no structure in this place. It was so bad. I, I, I constantly had to criticize them for not being better at being soldiers. I, it was appalling. Okay. <laughs> I wish I wish I had been able to give the same kind of rhetoric, you know, the same comebacks, because when I was told by the head of the department that my lecturer, um, you know, she brought in that guest uh, who had, you know, ears in different governments, and I had asked her questions, and she had been sort of struggling to answer them. I was told that my lecturer was uh, embarrassed by the situation, and I really wish I could have said, "Well, she should have been. I'd have been embarrassed if I invited her in." <laughs> <laughs> well or you should have you could have said uh well if she is embarrassed for this situation then she shouldn't be a lecturer simple as that mm. and, and, 